while we're actually serving, we're always thinking about, well, what's next? Or what would I rather be doing? So even though I really enjoyed my time in the military and felt very privileged to serve, I was always thinking, you know, what mountain was I going to climb next? Or what was I going to do in the business sphere? I hadn't thought at all at that point about doing anything in the oceans and ocean research. That came much later after I actually retired from the military after 20 years in the year uh, 2014. But at that point, I was certainly looking at other adventures and you know, had to have some fun uh, after I got off active duty. Frankly, actually, I got off active duty from my 9-11 deployment. That was about a year and a half. I had gone through so much and just really needed such a break. I actually climbed the highest mountain in Antarctica. So I really went off the grid for about a month and a half. And that was a nice way to reset my psyche to go back into the civilian world after that pretty intense experience. Looking at your trips from mountains to trenches, uh, tell me about the symmetry and the disparity of going from highest to lowest points. Uh, the symmetry between highest and lowest. It's interesting because I've been told by more than a few people that what I do is actually very rare, if not unique, and that people tend to be either deep ocean explorers or they tend to be mountain climbers. No one's ever like done both. And for me, it seems quite natural because we're all connected and the mountaintops are just as much a part of the world as the deep ocean trenches. And I love the variety. I love seeing all the different environs of the world. And so going to the highest mountain definitely felt incomplete without going to the bottom as well, going from the high to the low. So that was uh, something that I really was excited to be able to do. And it was such an honor to be the first person ever that actually climbed Everest and went to the bottom of Challenger Deep. So that was really cool. Going to both places helps allow me to really understand the world even better and just see things that no other human being, frankly, has even seen. In fact, I have an ice act. It's the only ice act in history that's actually been to the summit of Everest. And we strapped it to the submersible and took it all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. Planning and executing a military mission is very similar to planning and executing a major mountain climb or planning and executing a major ocean dive. A lot of it is about intelligence collection on the front end, understanding as much as you can, the so-called intelligence preparation of the battlefield. It's the same, even in business, it's the same thing. And I think that's one reason I think I've been you know, reasonably successful in business is that I've applied so many military lessons to that. So there's the intelligence collection, and then there's the planning. And as we all know who have served in the military, God knows we plan, and then we plan some more, and then we plan even more. But our plans are adjustable, and that comes into the execution where the best militaries and the best people in the military, those that can adapt from a plan and take in information in real time and then adjust immediately. And so across all these different things that I've done, I've tried to apply those principles and they've worked pretty well. That doesn't mean that it's easy because for example, climbing a mountain, when you're out there exposed in the weather and things go sideways and your plan isn't quite working, making those decisions real time while you're being hammered by wind and ice and all those types of things, it's difficult like it would be, I imagine, in real combat. Same thing in a submarine when you're two hours from the surface and you have a puff of smoke in the capsule, you're going to make an adjustment real fast. But again, they all rhyme. And so that's why I very much value my military experience because it helped prepare me for some of the extreme situations. And in the military, the consequences are severe. People live and people die if you make the wrong decisions. And so in a way, it gives you a good perspective for these other things where the stakes aren't quite as severe. You don't take it too seriously and you just work the problem. What were those heights of the depths? What were those times when you most were impacted by you know, turning your eye to the porthole and seeing something for the first time? Yeah, there were, I have to confess, confess, there were multiple moments that really stand out in the diving expeditions. Obviously the first time down to the bottom of Challenger Deep was pretty special just because technologically, we had all these mathematical models, we've done all this testing that said I should be fine. But until you actually do it, <laughs> go down to the bottom of the ocean in a prototype submersible, in the back of your mind, there's always somebody saying, I hope all the math is right, because even the best engineers in the world can fail. Uh, but it, it did work out well. So actually reaching the bottom of the ocean that first time was a very special moment. And on that same dive, I have to confess, and it's been widely reported, that just within the first 15 minutes, I'm cruising along the bottom, and out of the quarter, corner of my eye, I saw a very sharp angle. And nature doesn't do sharp angles. And sure enough, there was a piece of human contamination on the bottom of the seafloor, which is really kind of a gut punch that you would expect a completely pristine environment all the way down there, and it wasn't. 
So that was a little bit of uh, the world telling me that, you know, we probably need to be better custodians of, uh, of the earth that we live on. My training and my experience as a military intelligence officer really helped me deal with some of these issues that came up during the expedition when things go sideways. If you're a good intelligence officer, you read an enormous amount of military history. And in doing that, you see that there are innumerable numbers of times where things went wrong. And what did people do wrong? And what did they do right in those situations? So in that respect, I think I was just able to keep my cool and then just work the problem. And if you plan properly ahead of time, then you're not going to put yourself in a situation that is unrecoverable where you know you wouldn't come back. And so the, again, the preparation that you do as an intelligence officer is directly applicable to running a mission at sea and then having contingency plans and knowing that even though things can be very, very dire, there are ways out and you can make it home. And that's what we did. You know, what does the void see in you when you come out of the void? And it's a, it's a good question. And I think what the void is looking for is how did you handle yourself? Do you still respect yourself when you've been tested to your limit? And there's the old expression that you really don't know the true nature of something unless you put it under extreme stress. And quite physically, I don't think you can get more extreme stress than going to the bottom of the ocean. But I think people that have been in combat or even just served in the military have been in those situations where we are pushed to our absolute limits. That's almost the definition of what military, military training is supposed to do, which is to push us to our limits so that when we go back to that place for real, we behave in a way that is very helpful and productive and saves ourselves and our comrades. And so in a way, I think the void is trying to test us. The void is doing us a service. And if you come back and you're successful in your mission and you handle yourself well, it's a bit almost of a tip of the hat. Nature back to you saying, no, that's good. That's, uh, that's what it means to be human, is to push your boundary and to succeed well in doing it. Let's just go ahead and, and get this out of the way. Friendly rivalry, James Cameron. Do you want to, you know, you want to go into it? Yeah, sure. Um, I respect the man immensely. He was the first person to do a solo dive to the bottom of the Challenger Deep in a submersible that he and his team constructed. I mean, I probably have more in common with the man than maybe anyone else, you know, on, on that dimension of ocean research. I think the issue was that, you know, we actually were corresponding quite frequently before my dives to the bottom of Challenger Deep. And he even uh, told me, you know, how deep he dove, I think it was 10,908 meters. And we had a level of resources on my expedition that were greater than his. We had three robotic landers that could go down with me. We had the most powerful sonar ever put on a civilian vessel mapping it. He didn't have those two things. And we did multiple dives. We did four dives about the Challenger Deep when we were there. And so it was interesting that when we dove, when we came back up, I basically said, look, based on multiple dives and multiple sensors, this is the depth that we got. And the, the general reading that we got plus or minus was 10,925 meters, which was a little bit deeper. I mean, not a lot, but we reported the depth. And I think he objected that, that we dove deeper because I think he had a strong belief that it was completely flat in the Eastern pool of the Challenger Deep where both of us dove. And if it was completely flat, then how could we have possibly gone deeper that it was just measurement error? And that's a perspective one can have. And I respect that potential theory to which I said, I, the difference is so large, statistically, I think it extremely unlikely. And so I just couldn't agree with him. And by disagreeing with him, I think it caused some friction. I've since been back to Challenger Deep uh, 11 more times. So I, we've thoroughly mapped all three pools of the Challenger Deep, we've gone up and down. And I think we're quite convinced that it is not flat. It actually has undulations, as you ex expect, in a very geologically active place where two tectonic plates are crashing into each other. And it's not a lot of difference, but our numbers have held true. In fact, we had, you know, Dr. Kathy Sullivan, a former director of NOAA, she went down with me and she personally witnessed, as I did, that it's not completely flat and that our measurements are very accurate. So it's, it's unfortunate because I, again, have immense respect for the man and I think we have a lot in common. I just think that maybe where he dove was a slightly shallower part of the Challenger Deep, but he was the first person to solo dive it. I give him credit for that. So it's just an unfortunate, but he and I are both competitive guys, you know, so things happen, I guess. 
when it comes to going to the top and going to the bottom, what's left? What's to the side? Where is the, I mean, you said space, but that's a little more logistically challenging. What is the next destination? Oh, what's left? There's always something to explore. We're only limited by our imagination. So, I mean, I'm pursuing three different things right now, in addition to my day job, which is to continue diving. I mean, we've never really had a submersible like this that can go to any point on the sea floor reliably, repeatedly, and so safely. So there are so many ocean trenches that have never been visited by a human being. So we want to go to all of them, the Kermadec Trench, the Peruvian Trench, the Mid-America Trench. Who knows what we'll find? Maybe one of them will be dramatically different than all the others and will be a major scientific discovery. Maybe it'll be identical and boring. Either way, it will be interesting from a scientific standpoint. So we will continue, and we are continuing, our ocean research adventures. I'd love to go into space and even orbit one day. That will come in time, I think. And then it's just a question of paying the very high price ticket. Hopefully I'll be able to do that. And then I also will never give up mountain climbing. I love the physicality of going out in the cold and in the heights and, and really feeling that. And so this fall, I'm gonna be on a major expedition into uh, Asia to climb a very high mountain, which I haven't done in a couple of years. So I think it's part of human nature to always try and test ourselves. Maybe I do it a bit more than most people, but uh, I'm, I can't sit still. I've got to have these new missions in the future and keep pursuing them. Top Gun 2, are you excited? <laughs> I'm extremely excited to see Top Gun 2. How could I not be? Uh, it came out when I was a, a young adult and uh, I'm sure it had some influence on my desire to join the military. At any point in any of your missions, did you play Take My Breath Away as an inspirational song? I did not, oh. but God knows I've heard the song maybe a hundred times. And I absolutely have been in a bar and saying, you've lost that loving feeling with maybe friends of mine to a pretty girl. I have done that. 